Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for just how awesome it is and how it nourishes our souls. God, I pray that your word and your Holy Spirit would uh, just be in our hearts today, Lord. I pray that you would speak through me, God. I pray that you would open up our ears, God, and that we would have ears to hear what you have to say for us, Lord. I thank you. I pray this all in joy. I pray that you be with us, Jesus. Amen. So it was uh, April of 2011. It was back in my college days. I was walking out of my last class for the day, and I was heading towards the parking structure in Sac City, and I seen in the distance some signs, you know, some stuff written on them. As I got closer, I seen that it was, there's two men standing holding signs. The men were not saying anything, but the signs were screaming at the college students as they were flocking by to their cars. On the signs in big, red, bold, capital letters, it said, the end of the world is on May 21st, 2011. We all remember the days of Harold Camping, right? Out of my curiosity, I, I couldn't help, like, just pass by. I had to stop by. I had to talk to them. And I started talking to him, and I said, and this was a grown, you know, maybe 50-year-old, 45-year-old man. I said, hey, so uh, how do you know it's going to happen this time? And followed was a really long explanation of why he believed, he was convinced that May 21st was the end of the world. And I heard him out, and I said, okay, but, but didn't Jesus say nobody knows the hour or the day that Christ will return? And then followed was this long explanation of why of why Jesus was talking to the people back there. Right now, we can know all, all of that, all of that. And then I, as I listened to him, I said, okay, but what are you going to do if you're wrong? You know? And I was ready for his ex- response, but what I got, I did not expect. He said, I know I'm not wrong. My faith doesn't allow me to be wrong, to think that I might be wrong. I said, oh, okay, I get that. I respect that. But what if you are wrong? You know, like, what if the 1% that you are wrong? And he says, I know I'm not wrong. I know for sure I'm convinced that it will happen. There is no doubt in my mind I am completely convinced. And as I walked away, I walked away saddened and a little scared for the guy, knowing what was going to come to, you know, come to him just a couple of months down the road, of how convinced he was of this prophet, Harold Camping. But we know that May 21st came, and May 21st left without leaving a single trace in human history. To this day, I still think about this man every now and then. I wonder, where is he at now? Like, how did he react? What did he do? I mean, many people, like, gave up their life savings to advertise the end of the world. I mean, there's people who pulled out half a million out of their retirement. Where are they at now? You realize that Harold Camping, this false prophet that predicted the end of the world, he has a net worth or had a net worth of $75 million. This is a perfect example of a false prophet that just literally abused people. And people were traumatized because of that. Today we're going to be looking at false prophets and false teachers. And because the passage that we're going to be looking at is 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It begins like this. It's, it says, Peter begins saying, but false prophets also arose among the people. Now, when you read that, you should realize he just used the word but. That's a conjunction. That means he's, that, he's in the middle of his idea. So we need to go back in order to understand. You can't start a new idea with the sentence but. You can't begin a new idea with the word uh, and you, you always have to look before and see what it's combining and what it's comparing. So in order to get a full, bigger picture, we need to read a couple of verses before that. So open up to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For, and this is Peter speaking to Christians really closely before his execution. He says, For we did not follow clearly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain." And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well. Notice he's talking about prophecy. 
So he's comparing the true prophets versus the false prophets. He says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's saying, this is true. This is actually a message that's coming from God, directly from the Holy Spirit. This is truth. And then he compares it with false prophets in verse 1. He says, but... False prophets also arose among the people. Where there was truth, lies also arose. Just as there will be false teachers among you, so among Christians, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Now, you might be listening to this. You're like, you know, I agree. This is true. This is the Bible. Um, but how does this apply to me? How does this apply to me? I mean, I, m- none of us here followed Harold Camping, right, I think. We didn't think the end of the world was going to come 2000, in 2011, right? We, you know, everybody dismissed that. Most people dismissed him as a lunatic. And, you know, we don't have false preachers here, you know, preaching, trying to take your money. I mean, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, we're not trying to, you know, abuse you and get your money and, you know, living in sensuality and greed, trying to exploit people. We don't, we don't deal with that, Right? We don't have false teachers. So how does this passage actually apply to us? If, if, and and the, mainly a big reason of why false teachers aren't as big of an issue anymore is because of the rate of communication. Because back then, if there was a false teacher, nobody knows about him until you actually physically come to that place or somebody leaves from there. Nowadays, I mean, people could be on YouTube and calling me a false preacher in the comments section right now and reporting me to... You know, the Baptist FBI, you know, so it's just like it, it, the communication is so widespread. We're really good at catching it. So does this passage actually apply to us? And I'm going to argue that, yes, it does. And it applies to us even more than it did back then. But let me explain why. So first, let's look at the word teach. What does the word teach mean? According to dictionary.com, it means to impart a knowledge of something, to impart knowledge of something, or in other words, to make something known, or my definition is to deliver a new idea, to transfer an idea from the mind of one person into the mind of another person or into the minds of other people. It is the delivery of new information, the new ideas, right? So again, think back to when this was written. What were the primary forms of communication back then? Just think about it right now. I want you to exercise your brains as you're listening to me. What were the primary forms of communication? face-to-face, right, having a conversation that always existed, maybe writing a letter and sending it to a person, they read it, boom, new, uh, new idea, right? Or maybe you're reading a letter out loud in a gathering, just as I could read it out loud to you, and that would be new information spreading. What, smoke signals, exactly, new information, the house is on fire. <laughs> Uh, you know, you could come to a gathering into some public s- square or a church. You could hear a speaker or a preacher, and that's a transfer of new ideas. Uh, maybe you could draw or write something on the walls, and that's also a transfer of ideas, paint something. But besides that, that was really it. That were, those were really the ways of transferring ideas from minds of one person to another person. But nowadays, things are radically different I remember I was in, uh, it was my senior year in high school, and I was having lunch with one of my buddies. He was uh, heading off to the Marines, and, uh, and I started talking to him about, like, truth and God and all of that, and I asked him, you know, what do you think about truth? And he said, you know, I think all truth is relative, you know? I mean, you worship God, awesome, you know, and that's true for you. And, you know, I believe something else, that's true for me, right? And as I heard him out, I said, well, how did you come to this conclusion? Like, where did you get this piece of information? Where did you get this knowledge? And as he sat there thinking about it for a couple of moments, he said, you know, I don't really know. 
But I know he wasn't born with this idea because none of us are born with this idea. I know that this idea wasn't always prevalent in the minds of people because people didn't always believe this. So where did this idea come from and how did this idea come into his mind? You see, imagine if you come home and you see in your living room there's a donkey with a face painted blue. And you're like, what is this donkey doing and why is its face painted blue? And all the people that are at your house, your family, that day, all day, you ask them, how did it get there? And everyone's like, I don't know, it just kind of was there. It wasn't there yesterday. How did it get there? And everyone says, I don't know. And, you, but, and you're not going to say, you know, that, that, that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate uh, answer to my question of how it got there. That's not a legitimate. You wouldn't be satisfied with that because you know if there's a donkey in your living room, it got there somehow. Now, not all ideas need to be communicated into, to a person to form in their mind. Some of them, some ideas we can form on our own. We can synthesize them by sitting there and thinking. But majority of ideas that we live by are communicated to us in one form of communication or another. So what I want to make the point is that although we have less false direct teachers nowadays in churches, we have a flurry of teachers in all kinds of different places from all different sources. We have a lot of modern day teachers, teachers including music. It could be videos on Facebook, YouTube, Google. It could be movies, TV shows, books, podcasts, radio, news, social media posts, billboards, articles online, commercials, coworkers, friends. It could be anybody. Those are all sources those are all teachers, sources of new ideas into our mind. Are you following me? Are you following me here? These are ways that we receive new ideas now. Back then, people received ideas by talking, by reading a letter, by hearing someone talk you know, in a building, but that was it. Now we receive ideas from many different sources. All the time, there's new information, new ideas being communicated to us. And the crazy part I was reading an article on Huffington Post, and it talked about how music influences the world, how music and art can influence the world. And, and the, art, the quote is actually a bit chilling because it says, the best way to influence how people think is not to hit them over the head with your point of view, but rather to shape subtly the things they assume to be true about the world. Like, your worldview doesn't change based on the stuff you take in on accident. There are people, just like Huffington Post, this journalist is saying, saying the best way to shape the way people think is by subtly changing the things that you assume to be true about the world. There are people with these kind of intentions, publicating things with the intentions to subtly, gently, unnoticeably shape the things that you assume to be true about the world. And they're admitting it right here. This is exactly how the modern day teachers put ideas into our mind. They don't hit them. They don't hit us over the head with them. All those, the ones where you get hit over the head, you just get mad and you just uh, dislike, thumbs down, little angry face on Facebook, right? You don't take it in. It's the more innocent stuff, the stuff that doesn't hit you over the head. It's the little interesting quote that you come across and, and you're like, hmm, that's, that's a cool quote. You take that in, but you don't understand the effect that it has inside of you. I'll give you an example. There's a movie, I Robot. Now, Again, I don't know what intentions this was made with, but I'll tell you what kind of effect this can produce. Everybody seen iRobot? It's like an old movie, 2004, right? It's Will Smith, and there's like this robot there. Interesting movie. I watched it. I enjoyed it. But there's this interesting scene there where basically there's this robot. It was made by a, a, like this scientist guy. The, guy. the scientist guy, the inventor, died, but he, he invented a purpose for this robot. And the robot fulfilled that purpose, and then as, as the robot was hanging out with the detective, with uh, Will Smith, they're driving, I believe, and he says, the robot says, what about the others? Now that I've fulfilled my purpose, I don't know what to do. Now that I've fulfilled the purpose of my creator, I don't know what to do. And, the, and Will Smith's response says, I think you'll have to find your way like the rest of us, Sony. That's what it means to be free. And you, you hear that and you're like, hmm truth bomb, right? That's, that's what it means to be free, to create your own purpose. 
But you realize the, diff- the hidden implications behind that. It means that, you know what, the purpose that your creator has for you, it's not big enough. It's not good enough. And the only way you're going to be free is if you make up your own purpose in this world. And you might not even think that. And I don't know what, with what kind of intentions this was made. And I'm sure it was the best intentions. But do you understand the kind of things that can go in our mind and the way it can create, the way, shape the way that we live? Because all of a sudden you start thinking, no, it's, I need to decide my own purpose. That's the only way I'm going to be free. In fact, why is Christianity trying to tell me the purpose for my life? I get to invent my own purpose because that's what it means to be free. And the thing is, the crazy thing is, you'll, you're going to be like the rest of us and you're not going to have a clue where this idea came from. You're not going to know anything. You're just going to think, it's just true. That's, I kind of came to that conclusion myself and it's true. Well, little did you know, you just watched a movie and it was implanted into your mind, and the hook got you. Back in the days of Peter, somebody could come into a church, and they could pretend to be someone spiritual, and if they're good at faking it, they could start deceiving people and slowly leading people away into false teaching because there's nobody to cross-check. And and only until maybe some church leaders would come and verify and double check if what he's teaching is true. That's how false teachers were caught back in those days. Nowadays, it's different. You see, whereas false teaching used to be more isolated, secluded, and grouped together, nowadays it's just more widespread. It's just a shotgun approach. And it's hitting everybody, every single one of us who here seen some advertisement or heard something on the radio or listened to some music driving here in the morning, right? We checked our phones, social media. The rest of you guys are liars, okay? (laughs) I know the truth, right? We all encounter this. I'm not saying all of that is bad. That's not, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm saying these are channels and they could be channels for good and they can be channels for bad and false teaching. Now, next, what I want to do is I want to look at this term that Peter uses. He says, he calls them, he says that the de- false teachers will bring in destructive heresies. What are destructive heresies? And why does Peter choose to describe heresies as destructive? Well, what is a heresy? A heresy, in the Christian perspective, from Peter's point of view, is any belief that deviates from the truth, especially the essential very important truths of God and the gospel, right? Any belief that is not in line with the Christian faith. Now, what's been happening is there has been a shift in the way people think in the past, you know, maybe 50, 100 years. There's a shift because first shift is that the word heresy over the years has developed a negative association, right? When you think heresy and heretic, you think of like religious fanatics, like burning people at the stake. They're using the word heretic to manipulate people and control people, right? Oh, heretic, burn him at the stake, right? And that's what we think. We think of manipulation and controlling people. The second shift that has happened is that nowadays theologians, when you think of theologians, they get a bad reputation because you think of people who just sit in and study and argue about arbitrary things and point three point seven five nine. What do you think? Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. And it, it seems like there's nothing practical from them. And this is really well illustrated in a blog post I read. There, uh, I was reading a book uh, by Mark Devine. He's a Navy SEAL. Really fascinating book about a fascinating group of people and the way they live and the way they train themselves and the things that they stand for. Very interesting. But in one of his blog posts, he wrote, as he was speaking about the importance of spirituality for warriors, and that's actually something really important to warriors, talking about the importance of spirituality for warriors, he says, warriors are very pragmatic and don't have time or energy to argue about philosophy and semantics. If you read the rest of the article, in other words, what he's saying is you need to believe in something spiritual. You need to believe in some like karma, in God, in whatever, as long as you believe in something spiritual. It doesn't matter what it specifically is, as long as you believe in something. That's his main point. In other words, what he's saying is that truth doesn't matter. That right beliefs are not important they're not practical. You just sit there and argue. Why, pra- why argue? Just believe in something and then go and execute and, you know, and go do things. Go live your life. Don't slow down for these little details. Why are you going to argue? Tomato, tomato, right? Same thing. 
as long as you believe in something. So we, believe, so we are living in a day and age in a society where the concept of heresy is laughed at. It's like, what is a heretic, right? Theologians are seen as this impractical group of silly people pointlessly arguing about things that don't actually matter and where truth doesn't matter as long as you believe in something. That is the landscape. That is the worldview of the society that we live in. But this claim is absurd because when Peter says destructive heresies, he assumes that truth matters. When Peter says destructive heresies, he assumes that heresy is actually important and something to be taken seriously and not lightly. Let's suppose that you know, you're doing maintenance on your car. And for those of you who do maintenance on your car, you know that every six to 10,000 miles, you need to rotate your tires. You need to take the tires off, right? Who here recently rotated their tires? Thank you, Pete. Wanna? Right, there's a, so the point of it is you, you take the tires off the front, you put them in the back, and the ones in the back you put in the front so that it doesn't wear out, right? The tread doesn't wear out and they last longer. Now imagine you start putting them on and uh, you, take, you take the tires off and the thing that holds your tires, if I can get a picture on there, are, are lugs. Those are the things that hold your tires in place. And imagine as you were doing this, somebody went, came and took your lugs and they're gone. And you're like, okay, well, my lugs are gone. I don't want to go to the store, but there's some plastic lugs right over here. I'm going to use some plastic lugs. I don't think they manufacture those, by the way. But, you know, you take the plastic lugs, and in a world where truth doesn't matter, where the truth about physics and science does not matter, it makes no difference if it's a plastic lug or a metal lug. Because all you need to do, as long as you have tires on your car, right? As long as you believe in something, you're fine, right? And you put on the plastic lugs, and I actually want to, I'd love to test this, putting on like good plastic lugs and seeing if they'll hold the car up. And I, I think it might actually hold the car because there's so many of them. But you know what's going to happen is you're going to get on the freeway and you're going to speed up to 70 miles an hour and the first pothole that you hit, it's going to prove to be deadly because that impact is going to tear those plastic lugs away and you will die. So, Truth about physics and truth about science actually matters. It's not about just having something there to hold your tires. It's, it's about having something very specific, like steel lugs instead of plastic lugs. And so when it comes to how we ought to live our lives, the truth about doctrine, the truth about God, the truth about eternity, the truth about religion also matters. The truth about God is not gonna, it's not gonna hold your tires in place but it will hold you in place when you take your last breath. You see, without the right beliefs about the most important things in life, we're not going to, not only are we not going to be able to be saved personally, but also society is doomed to collapse under moral decay. And we've seen history repeat itself over and over and over again. There's a reason why the church, the historical church, over the 2,000 years that it hasn't existed, has taken truth and right doctrine seriously. There's a reason, in fact, why God commanded back in the Old Testament, during the times of the nation of Israel, He commanded false prophets to be uh, executed, to, to face capital punishment. You might think that's harsh, but in reality, if those people followed the false prophets, those people would have fallen under moral decay and the, Israel as a nation would not have survived. And God, in his wisdom and love for the people of God, he said, look, it's better that this false prophet, this person who is lying, who is wicked, who is deceitful, it's better that he perish instead of the entire nation. Now, let's be clear, that is not commanded in the New Testament because it's no longer, the purpose is no longer to preserve the nation of Israel. That has been satisfied through the coming of Christ. But now, it's about the church and about bringing the gospel to people for, so people can be saved for all of eternity. And the false prophets, the false teachers, are those who prevent that. And Peter warns us to say, be careful of the false teachers who bring in destructive heresies. Truth matters both to us as individuals and to us as a group, as a society, as a church, as organizations. And that is why scriptures tells us in Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart. 
for from it, everything you do flows. For from it, everything you do flows. If you have something bad in your heart, the flows, the things that are going to flow from your heart, everything you do is going to be tainted with that false belief. So that was part one. The second part, what I want to do is I want to look at these false teachers specifically. I look at them under the microscope of Scripture and, and look at what they do. So the first thing that they do we see here is they bring in destructive heresies, secretly bringing in destructive lies. And again, this is not just people who you know, stand in church, but it could be anywhere. It could be on social media. They don't have to call themselves Christian. It could be the news. It could be anything. What, what the destructive lies, the destructive new ideas that are false, who are those false teachers? What else do they do? They bring in destructive false beliefs. Two, they deny the master, or in other words, they deny Jesus. And three, they live in sin. Like it says in verse 2 and 3, it says that their sensuality, they're full of sensuality, and that in their greed, they exploit people. So they're living in sin. This is how you identify a false teacher. Is he bringing in false beliefs, destructive heresies? Is the false teacher denying Jesus? And is this false teacher living in sin? And the countermeasures, because I don't want to leave you hanging, you're like, okay, I know what a false teacher is. What do I do? How do I countermeasure to them? The countermeasures are three of them based on the previous three points I mentioned. The first one is to stay in the word of God. And that is to counteract the destructive heresies that come. You see, we're always being influenced by an onslaught of ideas. Onslaught of ideas. That's the world we live in. It's neither bad nor good. But you need to be armed. You need to be ready. And our minds need to be saturated with the word of God so that you would be able to spot the heresies. You know, you hear uh, in the movie, yeah, you choose your own purpose. The purpose of your creator is not big enough. You know, that's what it means to be free. When you hear that, you should have alarm bells in your mind ringing, no, actually, God gives me a purpose. God's purpose is greater than any purpose I could ever think or wish of. If your mind is not saturated with the word of God, with the truth of God, then you will be swept away by destructive heresies. You see, brothers and sisters, guests and friends, reading your Bible and reading it a lot is not just for pastors. It's not just for holy people. It's not for preachers like P. Anatoly, myself, Reading your Bible and having your mind saturated is for every single person that claims to be a Christian. Let that sink in. Do a quick comparison in your mind. On the left, list the, the other inputs into your life, the other inputs of ideas. And on the right is how much you're getting from Scripture. Do, do a quick comparison. Just put them on two scales. Where does it fall? And which way does the scale lean? I'm not saying you need to you know, read a minute of Bible for every minute of imp- you know, you're on social media. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not establishing guidelines and rules. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not trying to be legalistic about this. But what I'm trying to do is challenge you is, and ask you, is your mind saturated with the word of God? Are your thoughts consistent with the word of God? Do you know the word of God enough to be able to spot the false teachers that you encounter all the time? Where does the scale fall? Are there more of foreign false ideas and heresies or is there more of scripture? What is pushing what out in your life? Because they are at odds with one another. Or have we become like the Pharisees to whom Jesus said in John 8, he says, I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me. Why? Because my word finds no place in you. Is our heart so full of other things that there is no place for the word of God in it? What are are our hearts full of? Does it find room in us? Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell. That means live in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
The word richly does not mean read one Bible verse on my way out to work. That's not what richly means. Richly means an abundance. That means you have a lot. There's enough and enough to share with other people. Is the word of Christ dwelling in you richly? Again, I'm not telling you you read five chapters every, you know, before every meal. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm you know what it means if the word of God dwells in you richly. You know what that means. And if you're not going to be honest with yourself, who will? Nobody else cares about your soul the way God does and the way you do. That's the reality. And if you're not going to be honest with yourself, nobody else will. Is the word of Christ dwelling in your heart richly? Are you able to pick out the false teachings that you're encountering every day? Philippians 2.16 says, hold firmly to the word of life. Hold firmly. Can you describe yourself as that? Are you holding on firmly? And again, please don't get me wrong. I struggle with this all the time. I'm always fighting. I'm always trying to work on this. I'm always trying to hold on to the word of Christ firmly. And I fail so many times. I'm not setting myself up as an example. I'm just telling you what God's telling us. Are you holding on to the word of God, the word of Christ firmly? Or are there other things that you're holding on to and living by? Or maybe you're just holding on with a pinky. Where are you with that? The second thing, the second countermeasure to false teaching is to seek the Lord. Whereas false teaching tries to deny the master, true teaching seeks to, seeks to seek the Lord. Ask yourself this question. Does this new idea, this new concept that somebody just told me, that I just seen in a movie and I thought was interesting or I read online or seen in a video, does this new teaching, does this new idea glorify God? Does it give him the glory? Or, do, or in other words, does this new idea or teaching admit that Jesus is my master? Does it do that? Now think about the word master and servant. It's the master-servant relationship. Now we've uh, long forgotten about this relationship because we don't have this in America today. But, and, and it's actually negative when we think about it. But back in those days, it was not negative. It was neutral. It could have, there could have been great relationships between a master and a servant and negative relationships. It's like you and your relationship to your boss. That's essentially what he's saying, your boss. If you were to translate this into you know, 21st century terms. Now, in those days, the master was the most important person to that servant because the master is the one that provided for the servant and made sure they had a living. And actually, some people chose voluntarily to live and to serve their master for the rest of their life because they loved their master, because it was such a good, symbiotic, and positive relationship. But that's a side, side note. The word master indicates center. It's not peripheral. It is the center so in other words, does this new teaching, does this new idea, does it put God at the center of your life? Or does it put you at the center of your life? Does this new teaching put money at the center or God at the center? Does this new teaching put family, safety, comfort, fun, success, career, school, vacation, whatever, experiences, does it put those things at the center? Or does it put God at the center? Ask yourself that question. You can know really quickly if this teaching is false and if it should be accepted and if it should be believed. And lastly, see if this idea supports sin. Does this new idea, does it lead people, specifically you, does this new idea, whatever source of input that you have in your life, you know what it is. Is it, is it leading you into sin? Is a particular movie or show Music, is it leading you into things that you later regret? Is it leading you into obvious sinfulness? Is what a person is telling you, is it leading you into sin? If it is, it must be abandoned and left for the sake of your soul, for the sake of you not to go down the path of destruction. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about them. And if they don't qualify as any of those things, don't think about them. Don't follow them. Don't believe them. Don't pursue them. I want you to all do a mental exercise. You ready? Mental exercise. Get on that treadmill right now. We're, we're going to do some mental exercising. Who 
are the teachers in your life? Who is feeding you the ideas that you live off of? Who is feeding you ideas of how to live your life? Or what is feeding you those ideas? I'm not talking about the direct teachers. I'm not talking about your professors in school. I'm talking about the indirect teachers. Those who are subtly shaping the things that you assume to be true about the world. I was reading, a, I was reading on uh, some blog and it was, I think it was a, like a lot of like atheists and agnostics uh, talking to one another. And someone said, you know, the reason I stopped going to church is because I don't like people telling me how to think. And it was kind of funny for me because at church, we're honest about saying, hey, this is how you should think. This is the right way to think. We're honest about that. We're open. Everybody else does the same exact thing, except they're not honest about it except maybe that guy who wrote that Huffington Post article who said the best way is to subtly shape what you believe to be true about the world. Every communication is a way to persuade somebody to think one way or another. Almost every communication. But we're just honest about it here. A lot of the world isn't honest. If they're subtly shaping, who are those teachers in your life that are subtly shaping and molding your worldview and what you believe to be true about the world? And I actually recommend you go home and make that list. Like, write it out. And then ask yourself, okay, one, does this, is this consistent with the Word of God, what I'm being taught here? You might need to do some research. Two, does this glorify God? Does this put God at the center or does it put me at the center? Does it put something else at the center? And three, does this teacher, does this idea or whatever this input I have into my life, does it lead me into sin or lead me into holiness? Does it lead me closer to God or further away from God? Remember the warning in scripture, Proverbs 4.23, and above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The way you think is the way you act. This is a proven fact. Nobody will argue with this. And the, thing, and the way you think is influenced by the things you believe. And the things you believe are influenced by these teachers, by these sources of input, sources of new ideas, more correctly. And the number one reason, as we conclude, the number one reason why truth matters why heresy matters, why right belief matters is because of the gospel. You see, the gospel is the good news of God. But before we understand the good news of God, we need to understand the bad news that comes before. The bad news is we all live in a fallen, broken world. We all, there's just evil, there's evil in our hearts. I mean, if you could, if you, if you could see a video of all my thoughts on a screen right now, I would, I would leave to the furthest galaxy in the universe because it's wrong, because there's evil. I know none of us would want that shown. Imagine that. We all know we're evil. We all know we think evil things. We say evil things. We, we hurt people. Not intentionally, but we hurt people. And that's evil. And the problem with that is that God is not evil. God is the source of all good. He is pure. He is clean. He is... He is so pure, purer than the whitest snow. There is no blemish on him whatsoever. And that holiness, that purity, that goodness consumes evil. It cannot let evil exist, but the problem is there's evil in all of us. It's stamped into our hearts. And, there's, and the bad news, the worst of it all, is that there's nothing we can do to make up for it. There's nothing we can do to escape the righteous judgment of God. It's like, imagine someone who murdered somebody, and then he said, I, but I promise to be a good person for the rest of my life. And the judge says, okay, case is closed. Right? That's absurd. That doesn't happen. He says, I don't care if you're going to be the best person, goody two-shoes for the rest of your life. You, something that you have did must be paid for. And that's the problem. Even if we live the perfect life from here on out, it's not going to pay for our past sins. But the good news is that God, knowing that we cannot make ourselves right before him, knowing that there's no way we can ever pay for our sins except to be judged and locked up in the outer darkness, knowing those things, God sent his son, his perfect son, also who is made in the, also the image of God, who 
is the source of all goodness. He lived the perfect life, and he took on all of that upon himself. And he died a death he did not deserve in our place. And now the legal demands that stand against us are cleared through the work of Christ if you believe in him. And this is why truth matters. This is why heresy is a big deal. Because if you don't believe that, you cannot be saved. And now you're, you're saying, Peter, but, but you're being cocky. Well, you're saying, well, your way is true. Well, how about the other religions? They're true as well, right? How can this one be better than the other one? But you understand, it's not about being cocky or it's not about being right. It's about just truth, right? I'm, when I say you can't put plastic lugs onto your tires because you're going to die, I'm not being cocky and saying my steel lugs are the only right way to go. I'm not being cocky. I'm just saying that's just true. The only way to be saved from the judgment of God is through Christ. And if you believe in him, if you place your trust in him, then you can be saved. Then you can arrive safely to your destination. Nothing else, no other material will do. It won't bring you. It will instead lead to destruction. As you get onto that freeway and go 70 miles an hour, you must believe that it is the metal lugs that will bring you safely to your destination. You must believe and act upon the belief that only Christ can save you. Only he is enough to make you righteous before God. And if you believe and act upon that, you can be saved. You can be delivered. Everything else will fail you. Everything else will lead into destruction. And believe me, we're all going to hit that pothole on the highway going 70 miles an hour. And that's when the test will become real. Because it says, it is appointed for man to die once and then comes judgment. We're all gonna face that. And it's if you have believed in Christ, only then can you endure, only then can you pass over. Every, everything else will fail you and will lead in destruction. That's why truth matters. Because the gospel matters. Because the gospel is the only way but if truth doesn't matter, then it's irrelevant. And lastly, again, my encouragement to you, go home, as you go home, make that list of the different ideas that are flowing into your life. This, what is feeding you the life of your mind? What is feeding that? What are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you reading? Who are you talking to? What is shaping the way you think and assume to be true about the world? And does it glorify God? Does it align with scripture and the truth of God and does it lead you into sin or away from sin? Let's stand and pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth and that you've revealed yourself and who you really are to us, God. You did not leave us in the darkness, God, to grope for truth, God, but instead you have shown your light, God, and I pray that we would take that light in, God, and I know that that light might burn our eyes because we're so used to seeing that darkness, God, but I pray that we would embrace it, God, and I pray that we would live a life that honors and glorifies you. I pray that we would trust you all the way through until we arrive into your eternal home, God, to be with you. Enjoy, Lord. I thank you, and I pray this all in your name, Jesus. Please bless us. Please bless every single person here, everyone who's hearing this, God. May they love you. May all of us love you and seek you all the days of our life until we meet you. I pray this all in your name. Amen. <laughs>